So um, at, at this time of year, uh, that you can actually see these geosynchronous satellites moving past the Orion Nebula. And uh, so he was going to try to take a picture of that and send it to me. But this is the magnetosphere of Earth. Um, as, uh, uh, again, this is a, a result of a, of a simulation to get the continuity of all this. But it's based on actual observations. In other words, the model, the simulation you see here, is constrained by actual observations um, uh, that, uh, that were made of this phenomenon. And if I back away now, we'll see it more holistically. It go the tail goes out all the way toward lunar orbit. But out here, this is, and if I move around now, we'll see how its relation to the sun. And it's radial away from the sun. And this is, this is what sort of protects us. It, it, bath, it, it basically, um, it shields us from the, these, these large eruptions from the sun. And what does get through, actually, gets trapped in the magneto tail here, where you have these disconnection events of, of the, of the uh, essentially, the magnetic field lines. And then they reconnect. And when they reconnect, they've trapped some of that solar radiation. And <coughs> it then flows to the lowest potential. And that lowest potential is where it funnels in at the north and south poles, creating the aurora, when it then interacts, it interacts with the High altitude uh, ionosphere. That's the aurora and that's what creates that light. That's the aurora and aurora borealis and australis. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the energy is recycling. Well, it, it's uh, it's basically energy is being conserved. Uh, the the uh, the the particles are are flowing in, and they they lose their charge, but then they flow back out again. They come in. They spiral in, and then they spiral back out. And in, when they get caught in the radiation belts below that, interior to this, is where the Van Allen belts are. Yeah, that we're just. Of the Van Allen belt. You always hear about the, the fact that they're a very intense radiation. Well, that uh, they they uh, they are fairly intense radiation. Uh, there was concern that the astronauts, you know, would they be able to fly through it, and they did. Um, and uh, but the big concern was take the astronauts out of this entirely, which is what we did in flying to the moon. If there had been a solar event when we were walking on the moon, they could have died. And, and James Michener's novel Space deals with the hypothetical never flown Apollo 18, where the two astronauts on the surface die. The one who's orbiting was actually behind the moon and was shielded and lived and had to come home alone. So, but that, that was a very real possibility for Apollo. So anyway, now we see, okay, the moon orbits the Earth, the Earth orbits the sun. And at this point, I usually like to mention that, uh, okay, obviously we see the moon because it's lit by the sun the same way we are. So the light comes from the sun, bounces off the moon, and comes to Earth. The moon is 240,000 miles away, a quarter of a million miles. It takes light one and a third seconds to go from the moon to the Earth. And light travels 186,000 miles a second. The sun is 400 times that distance, so the sun is eight and a half minutes in the past. We now see the orbits of the other planets, interior to us, Venus and Mercury. Uh, the Messenger mission is about to go into orbit. Uh, the first time we'll ever put an orbiter around Mercury uh, is uh, happening on the 17th of this month. Yeah, and so one of the things I'm involved with now, we have a model of the spacecraft, a digital model, uh, and uh, we're trying to get basically the legs of, of the uh, components of the trajectory from Earth to Mercury. <laughs> And then going around, passing Mercury and coming back to Mercury and going into orbit. Now we're going to visualize that. And so that's what we're trying to do right now. Exterior to Earth, of course, is Mars. And what I'd like to do now is uh, just uh, illustrate for us um, how things move. And uh, so I'll, I'll, bring up, I'll bring up time again. My time controls. 
and I'll go in a time lapse of days per second. That's three days per second. Let's, uh, we'll start this moving. We can see Mercury is going around the Sun and Venus. And if I go really fast, you'll see, look, the Earth stays stationary. This is essentially what, to, uh, you know, this is essentially, um, oops. We're all gone. I don't know what happened. Wow. Wipe it away. Fan stopped. Uh, I'm a little bit worried. Um, I think uh, something happened. Oh, there we go. No, the uh, yeah, the projector uh, had a fault. I don't. I hope not. I. Uh, it said the fan stopped. I don't know why. Hold on. Let me. Let me. Just a minute. Let me let me plug it back in. Come on. Okay, it's coming back up. Uh, no, I'm okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Hopefully, the hopefully this will work. Yeah. Sorry about that. God said, "Let there no more." He likes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so it's not showing. No, he's waiting for it to. I it's it's going to take a few. Uh, it says power up, wait. Okay. But the fan is back on. Okay, I think it's coming back up. Okay. Yeah. They're really beautiful. Well, thanks. I. Uh, I'm going to take this moment just to try to make sure that. Uh... Okay, great. Powering up. Oh boy. Yep. If you think it's hard to visualize this, imagine how hard it was to build it in the first place. Oh, God. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, good. You got any more? Is that a good sign? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> it's showing something. <laughs> Better than where we were before. Okay. Here we are. Bingo. Yay. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> we're starting to worry. Well, here I'm. What I'm doing is I'm I'm spinning at three days per second. So the absurdity of this is okay. Yeah, the, the, that's you, me, and everybody spinning around at uh, a high rate of, of travel. But if we do that, we can now see how fat we see the moon going around the Earth. And then, of course, that the Earth goes around the Sun. Let's move around like so, just for our perspective. And uh, then I will bring the sun into view. And um, what I'll do is I'll actually label the planets for us as well. Okay, there's Mars. Oh yes, uh, the stereo mission, which, which is doing tremendous work. Yeah, and uh, in fact, a good friend of mine is one of the, the principal people on that. Okay, so let me just uh, let me close down a few things to make things a little more manageable. Is that sort of be able to sell 3D sets, uh, television sets? Or? Yes, it's, it's all a NASA scam. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm going to brighten the Milky Way for us. That's the nearest star to us, Alpha Centauri. This is the Southern Cross, which we don't see from the, our latitude. Okay, so now I'll pull back. So we see, okay, the planets go around. Um, the sun, I'm going to center uh, for us on the sun for a second. And in this, I'm going to also bring up some of the asteroids. Um, oh, yeah. I've read an article in New Yorker about that. Who wants to send men to the asteroids? Yes, and... and 
Yeah, and Ed, the, so the Ed, Ed Liu and Rusty Swiker, the two astronauts in that, we worked closely with both of them for a, a section of our show, Cosmic Collisions, where we show guiding Apophis away from Earth, and, uh, which was talked about in that article. But here, here we see the amount of debris. Okay, so let me just, let me, let me. Uh, just before the thing blew about the Earth being still at one point, you know, the Earth standing still. Oh, I, I was showing, I was showing the the Earth uh, um, sort of standing still. Let me, let me, let me just give us trails here, um, and uh, I'll come back to that point. This, these are basically the near Earth asteroids. Uh, uh, disregard that fast moving one. I think that's an error. Um, but here we can see how the asteroids are sort of all over the place. They're, defl they're, deflected. they're deflected by the planets into orbits that are highly inclined and things like this. So they're more like a cloud. And so we're concerned about finding out which ones may hit us. So you, so you come in close to the Earth here. Let me, again, let me get rid of the uh, support screens. Um, but uh, so you, you, get, you get a sense <coughs> with this, excuse me. I, I, I don't sleep any night with all this information. <laughs> so, but but you, you, you start, you, I mean, here's the stuff that could really make a bad day for us. But generally, it's safe to say all of these guys we know are not going to hit us. As, as crazy as that may look, we know they're not going to hit us. Now, I would like to just show, what's that? We do. Uh, we know that none of these will hit us. They're in fixed paths. Yeah. What about Apophis? You said something about Apophis. Apo Apophis, yeah, Apophis is one that uh, will come very close to us in 2029. It will, in fact, come in lower. It will come in closer to us than the um, than the geosynchronous satellites, which I just showed you. And the the question is, will that Earth's gravity is going to deflect it? So the question is will it hit us seven years later because it comes around close to us every seven years so in 2036 will it hit us and i believe the latest information is that it will not hit us in 2036 although it's a, it's, that's that's one that we worry about if you nuke it you just no if you nuke it you create a, a debris storm coming toward you what you'd want to do is nuke near it so that it might help deflect it. But they're uh -huh. different deflection strategies. Are yes. The, 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 all the planets are on the same ecliptic? Well, OK, the major planets, as we see here, pretty much are. Yeah. yeah. Is that caught or is that yeah. in the ocean? No, it's, it's actually in, it's, 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 it's a very good question that Harold just asked, which is, how come this? And that is because of the angular momentum, the spin of our system that uh, is the same spin we see with the sun and it's the same direction we see all the planets going around although you know the farther out you go the slower they are mm -hmm. that that spin is uh, left over from the creation of the uh, uh, of the uh, system itself you know, when when all the planets formed about five billion years ago are all so the moons also on that elliptical plane no, uh, well, to some degree, yes, uh, the, the major ones in Jupiter are. Um, but what I, I, I did mention um, sort of showing the Earth standing still for a second. I just want to make that point. This is something that, that Copernicus said that everything goes around the sun. Ptolemy said in Aristotle that Earth was the center of the universe. So if we, if we create the Earth as a center, um, I'm going to set Earth as my target here for a second. And what I'm going to do is enlarge the planets for a second. Okay, so the planets, I can scale them up to, let's say, 3,000 times. I'm going to make them 3,000 times bigger than they really are. That's 3,000 time enlargement right there. Okay? Now, I'm going to take the planets, and I'm going to get rid of their trajectories. I'm going to turn it, okay, they're uh, to uh, off. Okay, so now we, we see them go off, right? Yeah. And uh, now I'm going to turn off the uh, asteroids again. Okay, so now we just see the planets. Okay, huh. now let's move it really fast. Okay, so this, okay, now look at this. Jupiter's even coming into play. So we see the sun goes around, we got stuff going around. This is, now, 
Tico Brahe, he was basically uh, running flack for, uh, for Copernicus because he said, well, you know, the Earth could still be the center and the sun moves around us and everything else moves around the sun, which is the equivalent. It's, it's just, it, it's like Einstein saying, you know, all places are relative. It doesn't matter. You know, this, so, but you can look at it like this. Pretty wild, huh? But really, the way we think of it is, is much more like this. I'll turn the trajectories back on, and we make the sun the center. And so now, sun make the center. And now I'm going to make time go really fast. OK, this is, let's see, this is one month per second. And now we're looking at one month per second, and look how fast Neptune moves. Neptune's just hanging out there. It takes hundreds of years to go around. So this is our this is our reality. I mean, it's it stuff again moves in really fast. Mar you know, Mercury is just buzzing around the sun. Yeah. Like you know, Burning so up. right. <laughs> so this and now now what I want to show you is the farthest that humans have reached. Wait, before you do that. Give me an idea of roughly how large these asteroids are. <laughs> oh, the, the asteroids vary in size from, well, the largest one, about the size of Texas, is Ceres. And uh, that's like a small planet, you know, but, uh, but most of them are tiny. Uh, the, the Apophis is about the same size as Itikawa, which uh, the Japanese just uh, tried to get a sample of and bring back in their Hayabusa mission. And uh, that was about as, uh, both of those are about as long as the World Trade Center was tall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you heard of the one that's uh, reputed to come around uh, December 21st, 2012 uh, on the horizonproject.com? No. I think it's an asteroid. Uh, horizonproject.com. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, everybody to uh, well, check it Well, New Horizons. Is that going to be the Mayan one? Yeah, I'm a little worried about that association. Well, mine, I, I don't how, know. How, big, well, how big was the dinosaur asteroid? That, 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 was, that, that, that was seven miles. So that was like much smaller than... That was a 10-kilometer object. That was, that, that, that's huge. Yeah, that, that, that was big enough to uh, create... Well, why did the dinosaurs die? It, okay, first of all, it blew a crater maybe about 100 miles wide. And you say, okay, well, that's, that doesn't... You know, 100 miles, I mean, this is not the whole Earth. Why did the dinosaurs die? It's the stuff that threw out of the crater, raining back down the atmosphere, heated the atmosphere to, you know, essentially oven temperature. So all large meat died. <laughs> so uh, it it brought yes, yes, yes. That's right. So it basically, it it fried everything and and then and then created a sort of nuclear winter. Yes. Okay, I'm going to turn off. Uh, the labels of the, the, the planets are going to make them smaller. But do you see what I just turned on, these, these paths? Voyager and the Pioneers. This is Voyager 1, this is Voyager 2, this is Pioneer 11, Pioneer 10. And they have left the solar system. And we plot them out to the year 2050. So that's as far as uh, any... Man-made That's right. This is a, and they they will keep going. We just plot them to the year 2050 because by the year 2050, they will they will essentially be about one light day away from Earth. Huh. Uh, actually, yes. Voyagers one and two are still in touch with the pioneers. Uh, we they have we can't talk to them anymore. We 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 tried and. They're they're sort of beyond. Uh, we lost lost touch with them. Yes. The Hubble is only about 300 miles off the Earth. Trajectory. Hold on a second. That one's also uh, in in uh, close orbit, to Harold. Okay. Planets labels on off. There we go. Great. Okay. And I'm going to take the planets, and I'm going to make them small again. Scale, set, boo, there we go. So this, this is our reach out into space. Now I want to, okay, I want to show one last aspect in here as well. 
Oort cloud. Where is the Oort cloud particle system? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Is so, something for us to worry about again? Uh, yes. <laughs> comets. Where do comets come from? Okay, so uh, let me get rid of the... Okay, that's what this is. So once again, let's cruise down to the solar system. And we see our emissaries reaching out to the stars as they will continue to go. And uh, I haven't shown you Pluto. Um, I should show you Pluto because I always hate the fact that we've demoted Pluto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yes, it's a minor planet. But there it is. I, I actually, when I was 17, I met Clyde Tombaugh who discovered Pluto. And so I'd like to show Pluto as a planet. And, but you can see how it's off the main plane. And it really is a sort of, uh, it's, it's the beginning of this sort of icy asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt out here. But beyond, way beyond even Neptune and Pluto. Now watch this. So we're, we're going to bring up the brightness of the sun because we're going to start to look at the sun as, a, as just another star. So at first it's very bright. But we lose all of this in the glare, okay? And all of this around it, this is a statistical model, but this basically shows out to about one light year. This is essentially the sh general shape of what's called the Oort cloud, or the source of our comets. The Oort cloud? The Oort cloud. Oort. For, Oort, uh, for astronomer Oort. That's what's the foreground? What's the, this? Floating by. No, no, out, out in the black and going by. This? Yes. So we, I'm glad you noticed that, Harold. Well, this? Yeah. yeah. Well, now, okay, so Harold asked what that is, and in order to point out what that is, I need to do it this first. Which is, oh, I, I'm sorry, I have to keep bringing these things up. Um, but, okay. Okay, I'm going to go to. Uh, lines okay all right I've just turned on the constellations for us but they're gonna help us because Harold asked about something in the foreground okay oh by the way there's the Big Dipper okay and if I come down a little lower than this we'll see oh another couple things are moving and there's Orion the hunter Orion back here and you can see the star Sirius the dog star and also Procyon, the little dog star, so the two dogs. And if I move along, we see the Milky Way. Milky Way getting brighter over in this down here. And then we see that star right there. And for some reason, that line should be attached to it. I don't know why that is, why it's off. My apologies. That's Alpha Centauri, the nearest star to us. And so the nearest star is four light years away and the Oort cloud goes out to about one light year. So at this point, the stars are now moving. We see the constellations deforming as we move about. So let me turn off the Oort cloud. And the constellations, I'm going to turn them off as well. The Oort cloud is made up of what? The Oort cloud is made up of ice. Thank you. Uh, the Oort cloud is made up of icy particles, um, which really form up our comets. It's the icy remains of the formation of the solar system, and uh, whereas the rocky material gathered in close to the sun, making us here. You go farther out, and you get gas giants, Jupiter and uh, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then farther out, you get you get these icy bodies like Pluto, and uh, and also. Uh, Triton, which is the moon of Neptune, and uh, then you go farther out, you get the comets, which are these icy bodies, but that is the sun. That is Alpha Centauri. It's about the same brightness of the sun. This is the star Sirius, and so we're out now in this, this realm of stars. This is Altair. That's Vega. This is 16 light years away. This is eight and a half. That's four, and that's 26 light years. That star there is Deneb. It's 2,000 light years away. So we're now looking at the local geography of stars. And as we move around, we use suddenly the Milky Way, the glow of, 
of billions of stars becomes our new geography. Down here is the Pleiades, the near, one of the, the largest, uh, or one of the nearest star clusters to us. This is the Hyades star cluster with the star Aldebaran, which we see part of the V shape and makes up the Taurus, the bull. This is Orion, many of these stars very far away, so they haven't really come off the wallpaper yet. <laughs> now, as we circle around this, I uh, again have to pull up my heads up, but with this, um, I'm going to show you um, now the exoplanets. We're going to turn them on. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, there we go. Uh, the locations for the exoplanets. Let me actually uh, make sure that, okay. And uh, <coughs> I'll explain. Uh, they're exoplanets. These are planetary systems beyond the uh, solar system. Uh -huh. And I'll turn on uh, their labels. And to give us a sense of distance, I will now turn on the following. Solar system grid. Radial light years. There we go. Okay. And let me edit that and bring the opacity. Does the solar system have to have a sun or do planets revolve? Um, I mean, they must have a sun. Planets revolve around the sun. They must have a sun. But, well, n not necessarily. There are most likely rogue planets out there. And what I mean by that are planets that uh, may have been kicked out. But we detect planets around other stars by their gravitational wobble, basically. It's, it's a computational technique that needed to, again, thanks to computers, we figured this out in about 15 years ago. And um, so the first one was discovered in 95. We now know of 500 around um, these, these, uh, these other stars. And now the Kepler mission is looking at one tiny part of the sky, and they're finding all these new ones indicating that planets are just about everywhere. But these are the ones that we know of in our atlas. And so this is one light year, 10 light years. Remember I was pointing out Sirius and Procyon here, these stars. And we move out, here's Epsilon Eridanus, Gliese 876, which has B, C, and D. A would be the star itself. So that's a three planet system fairly close to us within about 10 light years. Yes, um, we know of a, a supermassive, about three million solar mass black hole right there, which is in the center of the galaxy. Where, and you know it's the center of the galaxy because it's, it's where the Milky Way is brightest. Would you say we've got a lot of black holes in the center? We, well, we have, we have a black hole that is in the very center, which is equivalent to three million suns. Yeah, and uh, so now I just want to I want to show you something in addition to this to give you some anthrogenic relevance. Okay. Okay. Anthrogenic relevance. This shows you a waveform in 1939. The British um, developed radar, and it was top secret. And just before that, uh, the Germans had played around and the Americans had played around with television broadcast. Both television broadcast and radars are extremely bright in radio. Early radio only bounced around inside the Earth's ionosphere. But in 1938-39, the first signals emanated from the Earth and followed uh, after World War II by television broadcast. This is how far, about 75 years, this is how far our radio signals have reached. They're still going, right? And they're going and they're expanding at the speed of light. That is correct. For infinity, will they go? Oh, yeah, but, they, but uh, as they go out, again, you, you say infinity, it, you, you're talking about time. Now, this is a very important part of the atlas because Remember, the sun is eight minutes in the past. The nearest star is four years in the past. It's four light years distance. So that what we're seeing here is basically 
our energy from our planet reaching on out into space. This is very real, but this is how far we have essentially, our radio waves have washed across the shore, shores of all these planets interior to this bubble. But they have not reached, say, HD 3712. Yeah. That's, that's Henry Draper catalog star 3712. It has some planets. Here's Henry Draper 37605. Um, and so these different planets. Huh. I thought you said the radio waves only went as far as the ionosphere. They only went as far as the ionosphere in early radio, but it was, it was with the birth of, of very powerful sources like radar and television that, that the Earth became the most bright radio source in the entire solar system. So it wasn't and actually the radio waves, it was radar and television that yes, went beyond? Yes, but, but they are a form of electromagnetic radiation. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So they traveled at the speed of light. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What? Uh, we see all sorts of natural uh, signals, and we've been listening for artificial or alien-generated signals, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, but we have not found anything yet that fits the criteria of what we, can, we would consider. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, in Arecibo and, and also, uh, yes, they're, they're looking there and, and other um, telescopes, uh, radio telescopes as well. Here is, in fact, Epsilon Tauri, a star called Ain. This is the nearest star cluster to us, about 100 or so stars, the uh, Hyades star cluster. And we are really looking for, you know, we're looking hard for these signals, but we have not heard from anybody else yet. Now, what makes you think that they, uh, from, uh, by way of radio, why are we looking <coughs> Well, because... If uh, they're sitting out there broadcasting like we've been doing. Or maybe they're doing it in a different way. Of course. And uh, in fact, uh, what we started off as being quite bright with television. But then television, then we became cable-based. And so we, we got more quiet. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's actually, it's, it's an interesting aspect of how cable has probably affected our... our uh, you know, so just not not because the aliens are scheming and they don't want us to see them. It's probably you know they're probably on cable too. <laughs> yes. Yes, Harold. Yes. Yes. Is it all answerable to the laws of thermodynamics? Right. And are there any of the planets that we've come into? They call it a Goldilocks. Zone. Oh yes, uh, and, the the, the uh, okay. You know. Well, okay. Uh, let me. Uh, as far as thermodynamics, uh, I, I would say that in this case, the physics of the situation is, um, for uh, as the signal goes out, it effectively gets weaker. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's 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 subject to the inverse square law of of of, of essentially propagation of energy. And so, makes a well, it just means that, that, uh, that say, a 25-watt bulb at the end of your nose is going to be pretty bright, but if yeah. you put it a mile away, it's going to yeah. be pretty dim. Okay. And then you crank it up and so it's an arc light, you know, and at a mile away, it's going to be pretty bright. Yeah, and right. if it's at the end of your nose, it's going to blind you. Yeah, right. So right. the thing is, is that, that, that so that's, that's one thing. Now, that also, that Goldilocks is the same thing. If I'm in close to a star, I'm too hot. Right. If I'm too far from the star, I'm out at Pluto, I'm too cold. It's amazing, the Earth. So, so Mars is too cold, right. Venus is too hot, and Earth, Earth is, is just, just in the middle. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. yes. So. And are there many other planets that we have, <coughs> in terms of thinking of organic process starting elsewhere and theorizing and so forth? Uh, I'm sorry, the, no. the, 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 I didn't understand the question. No, the, the organic process started, what, 3.8 billion years ago on this planet? We were in a particularly thermodynamic range that is very rare. Are there, are there certain ranges of other planets? They just found a bunch, didn't they? Well, in another solar they, 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 have, they have found some that they believe would be within the Goldilocks zone. Uh, the, and okay. so that we're looking for these other Earths. Between 212 and 32? I, I believe so. Yeah, and yeah. we've stayed in that for billions of years. It's amazing. Yes. So, well, let me show you. Also, you may have noticed that the, the, that the Earth was in a very circular orbit. Okay. What I'm showing you are the lines of the constellations of the zodiac. 
in combination with the exoplanets, our radio sphere, once again, our sun is right there. Okay? And uh, in fact, let me bring up, I'll bring up labels for the, for the stars for us so that we can, it'll help us a little bit. Okay, star catalog, labels on. Okay, so we should see sun. Okay, sun, there we go. And, all right. And other stars, Proxima Centauri, that's Alpha Centauri. And Barnard Star, there's Sirius, Procyon. You may wonder how I said, oh, this is that star and this is that star and whatever in a 3D database. It's just a matter of sitting around the star database long enough like I do. Okay, so let's pull back. How big is this neighborhood of stars to the galaxy? That's what's fading up now in the background. And if I pull up like this, we can now see the center of the galaxy. And I still have this target that's giving me 1,000 light years, 10,000 light years. In fact, the center of the galaxy is some 26,000 light years away from us. In a galaxy, it's about 100,000 light years across. So I'm sorry I have to keep bringing up the, the, the screen, but uh, let me do this where uh, Milky Way aligned, uh, solar system aligned, I'm going to turn off that, and um, okay, and I'm also going to bring up uh, Sun's orbit. Okay. Star cut. Whoops. Star orbits. Sun, okay. That is the sun's orbit now around the center of the galaxy. We're in a fairly stable orbit, not only around our sun, but our sun is in a stable orbit around our galaxy. There are other stars that are in wild orbits, but we are in a fairly stable orbit. So does our evolution mean that, that we have been somewhat privileged by being in, in, in close like this or, or in a fairly stable? I'm glad you asked because I wanted to get into this. Look at the galaxy like a look at wild sun or a stable sun. Well, okay, I can show you that. And then I'll get back to why well, look here, let me just Barnard star. Okay, there's Barnard star. It's fairly close to us, but it does flower petals. Okay, I'm going to turn Barnard's off. Okay. But I just wanted to show that for an ex uh, an example. Now, it takes us going around with all the other stars. It's like we're on a carousel. So we go around the spiral arms all this in the galaxy. It takes us a quarter of a billion years. <laughs> it takes us 250 million years. Why so fast? Well, we've been around 20 times. <laughs> Since we formed. Now, you know, give us a break. <laughs> okay, but what were we doing? Okay, with the speed of light, what were we all doing 25,000 years ago? That's how fast light traveling at 186,000 miles a second, it would take light 25,000 years to go from the center of the galaxy to where we are. What were you doing back then? Well, we were wandering and gathering. Well, okay. <laughs> no, but look, what we were doing, what we were doing, we were we were doing cave art. We we were Neolithic, cave art. Yeah. Okay. okay. According to the calendar thing, about the solar system dipping through that magnetic disk of the edge of the galaxy. Uh, well, it, I don't believe any of that, that but anyway. Up, you know, that it dips and it sort of oscillates through that at a 6,000 year rate? Or well, I, I, I don't think it's substantiated by any real science, but anyway. Um, what, what about Part of this is to ask you a question. Are we privileged? Yeah, are we privileged? Uh, it's, it's a really good question. Because, it, it, well, there, there's, there's a book called Rare Earth, which tends to take the attitude that, in a way, we are privileged. And that is that if you're in too close, you don't have enough metals. Mm -hmm. Out here, you have enough metals. But if you're out, out here, they're more depleted. So this is, exact, this is sort of the Goldilocks zone of the galaxy. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so that, 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 we may, that we may be, in fact, privileged to some degree 
for the conditions that support the life that we know and the stability that we've had for billions of years, essentially, to let life grow the way it has here. And what about the 20,000 yeah. years you didn't get a chance to make the point? 20, okay, my, 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 my point is that at light travel speed, mm -hmm. it takes 25,000 years, essentially, for light to go from here to here. So I, I asked, well, you know, what were we doing 25,000 years ago? Okay, so we were, we were Homo sapiens, yeah. but, uh, but, it, but now if you look at actually just instead of light travel time, that it takes 250 million years to make one circuit. Yeah. Let's go back one time. Actually, let's go back. Oh, let's see. Okay, so this one cycle is 250 million. Let's go back. Let's go back about to here. That's 65 million years ago. Dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Uh -huh. Dinosaurs. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's go back 250 million years ago. What was happening? What were we doing there? We were, we were crawling out of the ocean. How many 250 million? Yeah. Now, go back two orbits. Now, remember, we've been 20 times around. Two orbits back, what were we doing? We had just gone <laughs> multicellular. <laughs> so, so we were basically pond scum for like, you know, a bunch of, a whole hell of a <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, they, they believe about three and a half to maybe 3.8 billion years ago. 3.8 billion years yeah. ago, organic evolution began on this planet. Yeah. In the very beginning. Okay. Mm -hmm. Has it ever happened to the and, and, and it seems to have occurred just around the time when the Earth could support basically mm -hmm. having water that's stable and not being blasted off by giant impacts. Not being blasted off by what? Giant impacts, earth sterilizing events. So the giant impacts were decreasing at that point? That's enough? right. That's right. To, to have a, a stable atmosphere that was not getting blown away and having, having the development of oceans. Hmm. Yeah. And as soon as that happened, life seemed to have occurred. We still don't understand how that happened. No, we don't. We don't. We haven't been able to construct Our it. But, but be thankful but, that it did, Harold. But this, but this well, becomes yeah. like a. You can think of this as a sort of big galaxy clock in a way. This, this, the the, the rim of this wheel of, of this orbit around the uh, yes. center of the galaxy. The, how how much does the solar system waver up or down? Oh, good good question. In fact, uh, it's kind of hard to see with the glow of the galaxy on. So let me turn that off. Hold on, just uh, I'm about to get to that, but we haven't gotten there yet. Hold on. <laughs> so we're okay. Here, no, no. Here's here's the answer. Let's let's take let's take one question at a time, please. This here you can see the wavering, which is very slight. But that's that's the wavering I was talking about. That's what they're talking about with the 2012. But that's a bunch of crap. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. We haven't been there yet. No, no, no. I know. I, 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 no, no. Okay. No, no. I, it's. I really, I, 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 I really think there's. No. There's like no science to it. I, I, I think that that's. I, I think people are coming up with things, but. I, 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 I see no science behind what they're coming up against. Can I suggest and and look, look, if you think I, excuse me, if, if you think I'm dismissive, you should talk to some of my colleagues. Yeah. So I, I just, I don't, and I don't know enough about what they're saying, and I have, I have basically, I haven't read anything into it, and I just. They claim that they've done science before reading the ancient literature. There's a zone of more. Scientists at horizonproject.com. Okay, well, I'll, I'll look at horizonproject.com. I'm not qualified to talk about it. The important thing is to hear what they really know. Okay, so anyway, that was one question. The, the next, that, that, yeah, and, and so I'm trying to show that the deviations. You're asking about the deviations. Somebody was asking about the deviations of the orbit as as we go around, and they're they are very slight. But slight in those terms is what? Uh, under, uh, two, uh, 
500,000? Actually, well, we can see here that the uh, diameter of the uh, radiosphere is, uh, is about 150 uh, light years. So we're looking at, at something that's very slight. If I pull back to mm -hmm. the in entire galaxy, you're seeing uh, very slight. Okay. So again, I, I look. I'm just not. I, I'm just not qualified at all. I haven't. I. But also, I would say for the astrophysicists that I work with, yeah. I mean, you mentioned that to them. Well, they like they go ballistic. I I just told you it's a it's a yeah, it's I'd a like few hundred light years. Really Okay. A few hundred light years. Exactly. Okay. Look, I, I want to go. Actually, we'll be. Okay. Okay. It's it, we're going to be here all night if I if I don't finish up this. So I'd like to answer the other question, which was about the other galaxies. Okay. Great. And so if I move around here, we're we're look. There's that's actually a location of the Sagittarius Dwarf, which uh, is actually structurally it's an interesting situation since it's just off the glow. It's on the far edge of the glow of the, of the center of the galaxy, which is the, the glow of uh, the galaxy itself creates a shadow zone of galaxies beyond. This is the small Magellanic Cloud, and we'll see the large Magellanic Cloud in just a second. Is there a name for a cluster of galaxies? Is there a name for that? Yeah, so I'm going to get to that, but I, I just want to show, I want to do this one by one. What do you mean by a cloud? I didn't say it's a cloud. He asked about a cloud. I'll get to that. So what we see here are the Magellanic. Uh, uh, okay, these are the Magellanic satellite galaxies to us, sometimes called clouds. Okay, and that these are about 150, 160 thousand light years away from us. So the light we see from them, if you go to the southern hemisphere, you don't see them from the northern hemisphere, has been traveling to us since really the first Homo sapiens were walking on the planet. And their size? They're, they're small, and these are small galaxies that are interacting with us. In fact, we can see a warp to our galaxy, and we know that it's partly because of these having collided with us. And we can see tidal tails arching off of them, uh, which are not shown here. So then beyond that are smaller galaxies that are associated around us. These are minor galaxies, but if I pull off in this direction, I'm going to back up. All these other points out here are galaxies. And if I pull back far enough, we should see Andromeda. There it is. And the pinwheel. This is Andromeda right here, and this is M33, or the pinwheel. Now, Andromeda is the, is the farthest thing that you can see with your naked eyesight in a nice fall evening sky. Um, say, if you go upstate New York somewhere, you, you could see uh, Andromeda, and it's near the Milky it look, it's right next to the Milky Way. But it's about 2,300,000 light years away. So you're seeing light that left these two galaxies. Uh, again, they're, they're part of what, this, all together this is called the local group. But you're seeing light that left around the time Australopithecus was walking around in Africa. Seven million years. So, no, about uh, uh, two million three hundred thousand, yeah. And so again, all the other points out here are other galaxies. And now we see them more and more. And in fact, as I pull back, you can see dimmer ones coming in. And the dimmer ones coming in are part of, uh, there, are two, there are two surveys of galaxies. If I come in close, we're seeing Tully's group of galaxies, which is about 30,000. Now, I'm going to also point out another thing. There's a lack of galaxies we see here. And if I come in close, you'll see that the, the, our placement in the galaxy, which is here, because we're in the galaxy, it blocks our view of galaxies on our, uh, if we're looking right along the Milky Way. And so that's called the zone of obscuration. Because we're too bright, or what? Well, yes, because our because the glow of starlight is too much, and it, it confuses what it is that we're seeing. So this is the zone of obscuration right here. Mm -hmm. It's obscured. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you talk the Wilkinson telescope array, and then one I heard of. I'm getting to that. I'm I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. 
Um, so in this case, we're now seeing these galaxies. And every one of these is essentially out here. The farther out we go, we're only seeing galaxies that are larger. So what we're seeing now, every point is like our Milky Way. Now I didn't point out to you how many stars are in our Milky Way. We used to say that there were 300 billion stars in our Milky Way. But two things have happened. One is that we reevaluated how big the Milky Way was based on new observations of dynamics. We're bigger than Andromeda. We thought we were smaller. And we've also redone the numbers based on infrared surveys and what a threshold of a star actually is. So we may have a trillion stars in our one galaxy. Mm -hmm. oh, well, I was having a difficult time walking it with that three, 300 million. <laughs> well, and now we're seeing every one of these points is several hundred, maybe a trillion stars. Several hundred billion, trillion stars. So we're looking at a lot of stars. <laughs> we're, we're looking at galaxies here. How many galaxies are we? We are, we are upwards to, we have only measured explicitly as we're seeing here. In fact, this is the Virgo cluster up here, it's about a thousand galaxies. That's about 50 million light years away from us. I'll rotate around so we see that. Okay, that's our nearest downtown. And now we're seeing, what's this? That is, these are, this is a survey that's been looking in specific parts of the sky. And so we don't have, we did, this survey looked here, but not here yet. So we have an incomplete picture. Yeah. And so this, this now is what we have observed all together about two million galaxies that we've explicitly <laughs> measured. So they're yeah. equivalent to light pixels? Uh, yes, it, it, where, where you do, where, now, now you're seeing these rays come out. Because, okay, uh, let, me, let me try to describe. This is the shadow zone of our, of our galaxy. Mm -hmm. And so these tiny little points are part of what's called the two micron all sky survey. It's an infrared survey. It's looking at galaxies and it gets distances for all them. And then this is the Sloan survey, also accompanied by something called the two degree field survey, where we've looked in specific directions. In other words, they're like these butterfly fans that are going out. That means that where we've looked here, we've, we've made measurements, but we haven't looked here because it's, in parts of sky we have not looked at yet. Partly because the survey ran out of money, they couldn't, they couldn't finish, um, but also it sort of leaves room for future work. So what proportion have we looked at? We have looked at about two million galaxies. We believe in the visible universe we could probably see upwards to about several hundred billion galaxies. Oh. And each one trillions Yes, and that is just a small portion of what um, may be an infinite universe. And this gets on to what Harold was asking about, which is the Wilkinson mic uh, microwave background experiment, which is if I pull back far enough, okay, galaxies give way to quasars. These are the very brightest objects, but they're also the, uh, it's, we're looking at light from a very younger universe. This is when galaxies are forming. In fact, this transition of this glow of galaxies right here to these more uh, sort of uh, generally distributed, uh, these are the quasars out here. But right around here is where galaxies get too dim and we have to pick up quasars. That transition is about five billion light years away from us. In other words, the light we're seeing from these objects is about five billion years old light. So we're seeing a five billion years ago in the past well, what's the older universe. Is the older the bright ones or the older is the... These ones out here are the, are the, these are very bright objects. Galaxies in formation. Actually, we believe that they're the centers of galaxies, black holes with gas being poured on them, essentially. Um, and very bright phenomenon, quasars is what they're called. Mm -hmm and that this transition of galaxies to quasars is a re that, that we're seeing light from a time when we were forming, when our sun was forming, when our planet was forming. 3.8 billion? No, about 5 billion years ago. 5 billion years ago. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
right. Yes. And, and the brighter is more formed already? The, 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 right here, if you're saying this is brighter, yeah. this is more crowded. And that's why it's, it's brighter on the screen. The and this, this, is, this, this is closer to, uh, uh, to us in time. Like, yes. Mm -hmm. And so, so Carter, yeah, I more, understood that Wilkinson yeah. had a picture of the shock wave 200,000 years after it occurred 13.8. What you're years. now beginning to see is, is okay, I need, I need to set up for this. Oh, so, okay. so, what Hubble discovered. We're coming to an end of an what, end change. What, so what, what, really what Hubble discovered was, was that the universe was expanding, was he saw that the farther away galaxies were, because he discovered that the Andromeda was another galaxy, because we thought the entire universe in 1920s, we, in 1921, there's a there was a debate at the Smithsonian, um, actually between two prominent astronomers, and not one of which was Hubble, but they debated whether the Milky Way was the entire universe or whether these spirally shapes such as the Andromeda Galaxy, were actually other island universes. Were actually other? Island universes, other galaxies. Thank you. And so Hubble measured a variable star in the Andromeda Galaxy in 1923, the same year my dad was born. My dad's still around. He's 88. So in my dad's lifetime, the, the galaxy went from being like the universe <laughs> to being one you know, hundred billionth of the visible universe. And in 1929, Hubble published his paper that showed that the farther a galaxy was away, the faster it was flying away from us. The universe seemed to be expanding. This is something Einstein had predicted with the general theory of relativity in 1912. It wasn't seen to be the case, so he had to put in the cosmological constant. And he then removed the cosmological constant to allow the universe to be expanding. And so Einstein was seen to be the genius that he was and all this. He had predicted this. Um, I'm going to get to a part of the story which is dark energy, which we're now observing, which seems to write the cosmological constant back in in a strange way. But nevertheless, what was seen was the universe is expanding. Astronomers didn't like this because they said, well, that indicates there was a beginning. And the beginning invoked the yeah, beginning. Yes, the Big Bang. So Fred Hoyle, who had developed, Fred Hoyle's brilliant. Uh, he developed the nuclear synthesis chain, which said this is how carbon's made, this is how oxygen's made, in stars. And was observed to be the case that he derisively called the beginning event of the universe implied by the expansion observed by Hubble. He said, what do you, oh, what? You mean the universe started with a big bang? And so that, that term of derision stuck. And that's how the name big bang came about. It was a term of derision. And so then they also said, well, if the universe did begin in a big bang, there should be an afterglow, right? Whoa. <laughs> well, it's essentially way observed far enough out, you should be able to see this glow. And we don't see a glow. But it was discovered in 1964 at Bell Labs by Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. They share the Nobel Prize for that. But a guy named Dave Wilkinson, Dr. Dave Wilkinson, from, from Princeton, up the road, was developing an antenna to look for it. But these two engineers at Bell Labs discovered this noise in their microwave antenna, and they thought it was bird poop. So they cleaned out the bird poop, and it was still there. <laughs> and they were like scratching their heads. And Dave Wilkinson came down and said, you found it. And they said, what did we find? They said, you found the cosmic microwave background. They said, what the hell is that? The, what? <laughs> the cosmic microwave background. That is the afterglow of the Big Bang, and you see it in the image. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, that, had it and that's it. And it's now been mapped by the mi by the microwave. As I understand, it's the shock wave, and it goes back with Wilkinson to about two hundred thousand years before it's occurred. About three hundred. About three hundred. Three hundred thousand. Yes. Before it's occurred, and Liza, is it coming out of CERN? 
Liza is a, a, a ray that's going to get within the nanosecond of that occurring 13.8 billion years. Well, does that make any sense? Um, I'm not sure. If they ever get it going at CERN. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how they're, I, I, I don't know anything about that one, Howard, okay. uh, actually, uh, Harold, I'm sorry, uh, I, I, uh, about how you get beyond essentially what I'll describe now. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. Can I just change? Yeah. Let me change. But why, why yeah. Are you doing, Everybody. Why are you doing that? I just have a quick question. I got to change. Mm -hmm. If there's all, <coughs> all these planets and all of these galaxies and so on, mm -hmm. how are we ever going to be able